Hello there. Who are you? This is the Zodiac speaking. Killing must feel good to God too. He does it all the time. And are we not created in his image? We all go a little mad sometimes. After all, murder is, or should be, an art. I could kill you now pretty easily. Do some interesting things before anyone showed up. What are these films you can't wait to look at? Welcome to the Final Girls Podcast and the 17th episode of our series dedicated to on-screen serial killers of horror film and TV history. I'm your podcast host, Anna Bogatskaya, and in this episode, we're getting all goofy about serial murder. I'm joined by the glorious Mary Beth McAndrews, editor-in-chief of Dread Central and found footage defender, to discuss two films that have essentially the same plot, but couldn't be more different from one another. First up, we talk about the Belgian extreme mockumentary Man Bites Dog from 1992, which follows a group of film students making a documentary about an active serial killer. And following that, we cover 2006's Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon, where a group of film students are filming a documentary about an active serial killer. They sound the same on the surface, but they are radically different in tone and style. Man Bites Dog is one of the most controversial and violent films ever made, still banned in Ireland to this day, and Behind the Mask is a goofy, tongue-in-cheek love letter to slasher movies, with some of the best zingers I've ever encountered in a horror comedy. Please be warned, this entire episode is spoilerific, but I do encourage you to seek out both of these films because they're excellent in totally opposite ways. If you want to support the podcast, you can leave us a review over an Apple podcast or let me know what you think of this episode specifically on Spotify podcast. You can also go to Patreon and support the show there if you're feeling particularly generous. I did a whole mini series of the new Venture Extremity if you're into that stuff. And if you're not, that's cool. We can still be friends. You can find me online at Anna B. Demented. And with all of that said, please enjoy our take on Man Bites Dog and Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon. What is your official title, Mary Beth? For found footage. Is it like the the Serena of found footage? The queen of found footage? <laughs> What's, how should I properly reference you? I just found footage defender and academic, I guess, is probably the best way to put it. Oh, um, I love it. Doctor found footage. The doctor found footage. <laughs> oh my God, doctor found footage. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly, I would get a PhD just to call myself that to be, at this point. <laughs> Listen, I support Spite in all of its forms. So if you want to get a PhD in found footage horror movies out of Spite because people keep shitting on found footage, I support this. I will read your thank dissertation you so and I will oh invite God, you to so talk much. about every single found footage movie <laughs> that I cover on the show. Hell yeah. So thank you so much for making the time. And I've been looking forward to this episode because they're two very different kind of found footage movies very two different kind of serial killer movies to the ones that i've covered so far in this series but before we get into behind the mask the rise of leslie vernon and man bites dog i wanted to ask you what do you think of when you think of serial killers in movies so i i mean like obviously when I think of a, a movie, I think Silence of the Lambs always comes to my head, which is probably what everyone kind of thinks of. It's mm-hmm. like the big serial killer movie, I feel like. And Hannibal Lecter is like the big cinematic fictional serial killer. Mm-hmm. Um, that's like the first one I think of. But then I also, when I, after I get that out of the way, I think a lot about like female serial killers in movies. I think like I really loved the loved ones. <gasps> Like, the Australian, like, that one especially. And there aren't a lot of movies where women are the serial killer or, you know what I mean? So, Mm -hmm. like, movies like The Loved Ones where the woman is kind of in that role, I love because 
obviously I'm a big horror person. I'm not also a true crime person, which mm. makes sense bringing these together. And, you know, a lot of the time serial killers are men and there's so much psychology and interesting thoughts behind like the actual reason why. And women are not usually serial killers. So when I see a female serial killer, just even fictionalized, I'm obsessed. So I go from Silence of the Lambs to The Loved Ones is kind of like my arc in thinking about really interesting characters, but then also what it looks like when you have someone a little bit different as a serial mm-hmm. killer. And very different type of killers to both those characters. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So what is your relationship with both of the films that we're going to be talking about in this episode? Yeah, so this is interesting because Behind the Mask, I love. I mm-hmm. And I'm excited to talk about it, and I love what it accomplishes. But Man Bites Dog, I actually just watched very <gasps> recently for um, my... I'm actually I'm writing a book about paranormal activity, and I'm trying to give kind of like a brief history of found footage in the introduction, and Man Bites Dog is obviously in there, and I hadn't seen it. Mm-hmm. So I just recently watched it and was... Um, it's very interesting in the conversation of found footage, especially when this was made and kind of how it situates itself in that conversation about found footage and what even is found footage and what it was in the 90s before mm-hmm. the Blair Witch Project. Mm-hmm. So it was it's exciting to talk about it because it is like a newer film for me to have watched, but I've always known about it. I just is one of those movies I was like. I don't know. And now I finally watched it. And now I'm like, oh, I know now. (laughs) It does sort of have that infamous reputation, but that is so cool. So tell me, tell me where it exists in the, in the history of found footage specifically, because this film was released in 1982. It's screened in the festival, the Canfield festival. Yes. And it's Belgian. This came out in 1982 and ghost watch, um, which was, you know, the British broadcast was mm-hmm. also 1992. And before that, really the only other kind of, and everyone, sorry if I make a mistake and forget, but it's really like Cannibal Holocaust and then we jump to Man Bites Dog and Ghost Watch mm-hmm. is kind of like the jump, which is really interesting because I think Man Bites Dog is the next evolution of Cannibal Holocaust. And if anyone hasn't seen cannibal holocaust get the title is as bad as it sounds i am not a big fan of it but i appreciate the form but i'm not a huge fan but Mm -hmm. basically the second half is discovered footage of a film crew who went to look for a, a cannibalistic village and we see what happens and i think that kind of crazy violence that's in cannibal holocaust is transferred but put into a different context of man bites dog um, and then Ghost Watch is kind of that weird branch off of that. And then I think Man Bites Dog was actually a pretty big influence on the Blair Witch Project. So I think it's this really interesting evolution of like extreme violence and capturing that mm-hmm. into what found footage is now, which there is extreme violence in it, but not as much as we see in these earlier renditions, especially with documentary crews capturing something like flies on the wall. But then as we're going to discuss what happens when they participate in that. Um, So it feels like those films are less engaging with the form of found footage, but more like the filmmaker and like the responsibility, which I think is really interesting. It's really interesting to jump so hard from the Mondo style filmmaking of Cannibal Holocaust, which is very much premised on this very simplistic and very colonial idea of, oh my God, let's go somewhere foreign and look at the weird foreigners. They're all strange and obviously they're all cannibals because they're quote unquote savages and we're not. And this one also is situated in a long history of European filmmaking of the French Nouvelle Vague, of this idea of young Turks just taking a camera, of young students taking a camera, going out into the street with no permits, with no sanctions, with no support from um, the the government or any sort of grants to just make a film to see if they can. And simultaneously it also exists within the framework of the new French extremity now it is a Belgian Mm. film but it's also often associated with that particular wave of the 
late 90s yeah. and early 2000s of extreme, extremely violent and hypersexual European cinema. I've done, I did a whole series, uh, curated a series of those films at the British Film Institute a couple of years ago. That was interesting. So cool. <laughs> yeah, I can only imagine like, hey, everyone, welcome to the theater. Uh, oh, yeah. Let's watch this. And let's talk about it. <laughs> Tons <laughs> angry. of trigger warnings for every single film. So many. I was so proud. And there's a, for anyone interested <laughs> more in those films, there's a mini series that I did uh, with a lecture that I wrote for that um, event over on the Patreon. But that's by the by. This is also kind of one of the precursors of that because it's quite early I- on. Yeah, it's so early. And I think that, I mean, I think that also speaks to just like European cinema in general, I think, and like European indie Mm -hmm. cinema, and indie thriller horror genre cinema. And like, because I know that in some some filmmakers, especially European filmmakers, and the people I've talked to are so hesitant around the horror label, because I think it has such different connotations for some people. I know the word horror is so subjective for everybody, but like with European filmmakers, it seems like a bad word. And I think because a lot of countries seem to think of horror as this like cheesy thing. It's a commercial conversation. Yeah, exactly. And so like this kind of movie, I consider a horror movie, but other people might not because they're like oh this is more than horror i'm like no this is like pretty much a horror movie it's just like obviously a very different format and kind of form of horror but regardless i love new french extremity i have a giant new french extremity flag next to me with all of the final girls of like new french extremity next excuse to me, me? So, like there's a flag i know i, I don't i have to send it to you it's like oh my this God. big poster with like all of these it's got like Every it's got Beatrice Dale from Inside <gasps> with a knife. Uh, we've got the girl from Martyrs with the thing on her face. We've got obviously Marie from High Tension. We've got oh the uh, Frontiers girl, and they're just hanging out on my wall. So I love them forever. I'll Did you make this flag? No, I bought it from somebody. There I is to find someone it again. out there in this world making new French extremity flags, and this person yeah, is not in my DMs. Us. I love this person, whoever you are. I, I know. must find you and befriend you. Okay, I'll send it to you, though, because <laughs> Please do. I love new-, new French extremity is, like, a huge thing for me, and Same. this movie, I think, definitely is, I think, on the edge, and is, like, introduced. I think it is a precursor, and, like... Totally. I mean, Belgian... I- oh, God, what is his name? His film... Um, Calvair is Belgian. Yes. So, yeah. I was like, damn it. Um, so I think it it does fit into the conversation because again, there it like this for nineteen ninety two European cinema is violent as hell. You know what I mean? Like yeah. so violent. Well, and I don't say that was a bad thing, but like it just is. Like it is confronting and unflinching. And that is scary for a lot of people, especially when they're not expecting it. Well, this film, literally within 20 seconds of starting, it, there's a murder. Yeah. <laughs> I'm it, s- obsessed with that. It <laughs> wastes no time. There's a monta- There's several montages of murders. There is so much conversation yep. about body disposal. So There's children, older people so being murdered nice. savagely. And... Yep. And the entire premise, and it's actually the same premise for both of the films we're discussing, treated in very different manners. Uh, It's a group of student filmmakers that want to make a fly-on-the-wall style documentary about an active serial killer who's a willing participant in their project. The serial killer in this case is Ben, played by Benoit Poulvoet, I think is the way you pronounce his name. Don't DM me if I fuck that up. Um, (laughs) And he... He is fully enjoying the attention. What do you think of the way that they characterize Ben? I loved it. And also, he's one of the directors, too. Like, the three main guys are, like, direct, like, direct the directors and producers of this, obviously, because it's such a small film. But I love, because I, like, with with both films, they're similar approaches, and there's dark comedy to both. But, like, Man Bites Dog is, like, bleak dark comedy it's not like there's like because there's moments where the whole point of him being like his characterization is there's comedy to him like he's light he's not always in serial killer mode he's always but he's always talking and i kind of i love that they have him one be this like kind of normal looking guy you meet him and he just looks like a a dude you know like he's just a belgian dude you we 
in Belgian do. You think of like serial killer movies. There's always like they're very creepy and they look a very particular way. But this guy is just a normal dude and he immediately is killing. And I think that's why it's so disarming is because he just looks like a regular guy. And the way he is able and not, I guess not able, but the way his, he switches mm-hmm. from like kind and seemingly empathetic to just like the cruelest person you've ever met is so scary because i think it feels so real i think we've all met people not serial killers but like people that can switch so quickly on a dime going Mm -hmm. from like the funniest person you know to the meanest person you know and so it's so interesting to see how they play that and how unpredictable he is but also predictable like we know he's going to kill but there is still that unpredictability to his actions because like i'm thinking when they go visit the old woman and instead of shooting her he screams in her face and gives her a heart attack like absolutely harrowing but also like a little bit funny in the darkest way humanly possible and also shows just how weird he is he's like i didn't waste a bullet see i just like killed her and with a fear and it's just something about it is so real feeling and gross if yeah it's the same effect that the blair witch project would have a few years later it's the fact that they're unknowns uh yeah exactly yep these are unknown faces to most i mean they were student like film students so they were completely unknown to the french and the belgian film industry but kind of at a, to the world at large even picking this film up now if you randomly stub- stumble uh through it you'd be like are these are these real guys is it this- does it feels so real and the fact that it's shot so cheaply as well i think yep. plays another role into it because there's no flourishes Every there's no. no kind of mise en scene. I mean, there is, but that's a over intellectualizing the film a little bit. The way that it, the pretense of the the found footage element of it is that it's rough and ready. That these guys are just yep. in there with this dude. We get no explanation as to how they found him, who who he is. And what I find most unsettling about the way that he's played is that a it's the switches the switches between sort of making cracking bad jokes reading poems trying to be all blustery and um full of himself to yeah. murdering someone by screaming in their face or raping a woman and making fun of her during it it's yep. it's the fact that he has no fantasy he has no origin story he has no particular vision or methodology he just kills yep. seemingly at random if he just like feels like fun. it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and that, so this is what, have you seen Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer? Obviously, yes. Okay, good. I figured you had. <laughs> this is like, because that movie feels like found footage to me. It's yes. not. But like the way they shoot that movie, I think, can, like th- this, again, Man Bites Dog feels like an evolution of Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. Interesting. In terms of like capturing that kind of person. Mm-hmm. Obviously, and in, the, in Man Bites Dog, there's more kind of personality to the serial killer here. Mm-hmm. But just the way they're both shot and the way we get embedded with these characters is so interesting. And to have the documentary crew there as like actual characters. I think just adds more layers to, again, like the serial killer narrative and what it means to watch these kinds of things. Um, well, it feels very true crimey yeah. as well. Even, oh, the, yeah. even the title of it, the original title is, in translation says something along the lines of it happened close to your home or, cl- or it happened close to It was like it you. happened in your neighborhood. Yes. It happened in your neighborhood was like the, yeah. And again, before... Well, true crime, I guess, has always been sort of a thing forever. And it was really huge in the it. 90s in particular. Yes! Yes! We're, we were talking about the way that he is presented as remorseless and so and kills so suddenly. What do you think about the way that the violence is filmed in, the, in Man Bites Dog? I mean, it's interesting because it feels a bit detached at first. Like... It, again, it's a documentary, so you're like, this is really shocking, especially if we're introduced to him, the first thing he does is grab a woman, like, mm-hmm. so brazenly on a train, and just, like, kills her, and then disposes of her body, and we see him shoot people, and it just feels so quick, it's almost like you can't really absorb it at first, mm-hmm. but then, as the film progresses, and also as the crew starts getting involved, you really start, I think that's where the violence, to me, 
is like, oh my God, like we're really going in here. And I still think it's pretty shocking. Like even in the year of our Lord 2024, when we know we've seen so much stuff, I still think it is a shocking film because this is a film where they didn't have any rules. They could Mm -hmm. do whatever they wanted to a fault sometimes. You know what I mean? Of just like, let's see how far we can go in terms of showing sexual assault. Like it's not just killing people. It's raping women raping people and like kind of and I guess not defacing but kind of defacing the bodies too there's something so base about that especially when the other people get involved and then obviously there's the other parts that involve um, his family getting like revenge killings on his family and I, I don't know if it's I still think it's pretty but I think like by our standards today it's still pretty pretty extreme and in 20 and when it came out in the 90s i can only imagine like the reactions to seeing things like this on like at can and on screen i mean i think it's really important but i also know that people don't like that kind of stuff mm-hmm. <laughs> like react very poorly because like obviously this is a very violent film but i also think it's a really interesting commentary on how we consume it and how we interact with it but you know, so a lot of audiences might not be able to look past that violence to really mm-hmm. understand the point of the violence. And I think that's what I love so much about new French extremity films is like, yeah, it's grotesquely violent, but like there actually is a point. Like there is something being said here. And while you might not think so, I think there is. I think there is something really interesting being said about how we engage with this kind of topic. And what do you think is the point of the violence in this one? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I do, I do think it is kind of this evolution of these movies of showing like, oh, you want to watch people kill people? We're going to show you what it's like to watch people kill people. Mm. And I think there's a movie called Long Pigs, which is a found footage movie that is from a lot. I can't remember what's from, but I interviewed the director for Unnamed Footage Festival a couple years ago because they showed it. And it's about a documentary crew following a guy who's a cannibal and oh. they're watching him not just kill people, but butcher them in his basement to eat them. Mm-hmm. And it's very man bites dog, but with a cannibal. And I think it's so interesting to watch a film where we are being like, where there are people who are the audience proxy being forced to kind of grapple with what's happening in front of them and what they choose to do. And I know that this is similar in behind the mask, but with man bites dog, it gets very easy to more be like, what would I do in that scenario? Like, would I be part of this? Like, you want to think you wouldn't, you know what I mean? But mm-hmm. like, I think in films like this, it's so easy to like, for you know, documentary filmmakers and scare quotes to be like, it's part of the movie. It's fine. And it like that slippery slope that I think a lot of audiences might not think about when it comes to making documentaries and true crime documentaries and that slippery slope of what it means to become part of that narrative, even if you don't want to be part of that narrative. And I also think it talks about the alluring, like the alluring nature of violence, especially to men. Mm. Yeah, I think there's an uninhibitedness to Benoit, to his Ben's character that I think there is like a really gross male fantasy in there somewhere. I'm not saying that it's like a real fantasy, but I think there is like in this movie kind of these guys being able to go along with him and enact these things that they hadn't been able to before. Mm. There's like a weird fantasy aspect there as well. There totally is. There's like an arrogance to him. And yeah. that arrogance goes up to 11 when he literally murders someone on a dinner table and his family continue giving him presents. That's, I think, when it crosses over to yep. sort of more... Uh, fo- I mean, it's comedic from the start in a really, really dark way. But that, I think, is when it goes hard into the nonsensical element. But one thing I find... As I was re-watching it, I watched this film originally when I went through my first new French extremity phase when I was in university <laughs> and I was in France. So it was uh, all of a sudden these films sort of revealed themselves to me. And I was like, what? what is this? This is so much more aggressive than anything I had ever seen before. One thing that I re-watching and I still find quite shocking is that it's inter- it's showing us the process without any without any aesthetics as in yep. without making it pretty the blood is black the kills happen very quickly there is a lot of bodies 
bodies are being moved around, they're being touched, they're being disposed of brutally. Um, it's completely unfeeling about the process because that's kind of what it involves. When you kind of bring up the cannibal found footage uh, mockumentary that I really want to watch now, is there's a thing of, oh, we, we make the jokes... We do the little fan cams on TikTok about Dahmer. We do the puns. Mm -hmm. We love Hannibal, the TV show, because it presents kind of this idea of, would you eat this beautiful gourmet dish if you knew that it was someone's liver, like a person's liver? Mm -hmm. But that is... like, what happens if they're hot? Yeah. (laughs) Like, you said that it's, like, so interesting. Like you said, aesthetics. It's so fascinating, like, how... If it's an aesthetically pleasing serial killer narrative, it's easier to excuse or yes. like connect with. It's just so fascinating. But that is that's all filtered through something cinematic and pretty. And the cinematic filter of choice yep. here is deliberately um ugly. It's deliberately yep. very, very dank in a way. I think it's kind of the best word to describe it, because it's not a fun yeah. movie to watch. It really is quite Ooh. grimy. And I think part of it for me was it's- like I- like especially considering it for the true crime lens you're like oh if this if we could actually film like an ed kemper or someone like that doing their crimes i think this is what it would look like it would be someone chatting through their process of cutting off someone's head and cracking jokes in the same breath and after a certain point would it just become the same as say working in a slaughterhouse or doing any Ooh. other job yeah i mean it's a good point because again like we want to romanticize these narratives so much but man bites dog just removes that romanticization like even silence of the lambs like there's that like relationship between Lecter and Clarice that like you kind of want to see succeed and he seems to be like oh well fuck the bad guys I'm only gonna eat these like terrible people but you know he's not like that but there is still that romanticization a little bit Mm. between the two of them and his character you know that sounds silly but like there is a stylization to him as being like this intellectual but here it's just like a guy and just a dude another dude on the street yeah. And he's doing really terrible things and you're just capturing them. And like, that's the reality of these things. There isn't like some romantic, crazy thing. And a lot of these guys are like, if you like read about them even more, like they love getting caught. They love the attention. A, whole, mm-hmm. a lot of the point of these serial killers is getting that attention and getting that love. So like, I think this is such a real pseudo documentary and looking at like what a serial killer like you said would be like if we and i think like you said more people if you like true crime i think you should watch man bites dog and give yourself a dose of reality of like the kinds (laughs) of people you might be romanticizing and you make an interesting point of you know what is the because the the filming crew is essentially the audience surrogate in the sense because they're they're yeah. doing this project and they become increasingly involved not just as witnesses but as participants in his crimes. What do you make of the evolving relationship between Ben and the filming crew? I mean, I love a movie like this where it like really implicate like instead of just having them, you know, film, they really engage with this like really really engaged with their subject because I think it does I think it really brings attention to the artifice of documentary filmmaking in a really interesting way because I took I took one class long ago on documentaries in college and I was so fascinated by it because I had never thought about documentary like so deeply about how you frame things and like how even though you think it's like it's objective it's not and like the different subjectivities in documentary and i think this movie does such a good idea such a good way of playing with that idea of like okay you think it's documentary we're ready for subjectivity and or objectivity and then what happens when you become involved with your subject and what happens what really happens when you can't separate yourself But then also on top of that, it's like also asking questions of like what kind of stories are appropriate to tell and capture on camera and what kind of stories like do we really want told 
and what and like what is adult, what is our responsibility as filmmakers and as viewers in terms of consuming content like that too mm. and i think that is so interesting when these films play with that form of like hmm what happens when the filmmaker is no longer just behind the camera and not someone you can't like acknowledge and i think that's what i love about found footage in general is like the filmmaker whether it be the literal person holding the camera or the director becomes a character in ways that you're not used to. And it mm. makes you really think about what it means to make a movie. And I think Man Bites Dog brings that in. Like Cannibal Holocaust did that like very obviously with like, oh my God, they, they, when they watch the documentary in the office, they're like, oh, we can't show this to anyone. But Man Bites Dog presents it so much more, neutrally which is a weird way to say it but like you're just given it and it's like mm-hmm. all right so what do you think it's not really telling you like yes you know it's bad but like it's not really moralizing anything it's kind of just like all right what do you think what do you think of these guys starting to kill like it's kind of presented in such an interestingly yes not neutral but kind of neutral way and you have to kind of be like wait hold on a second what how do i feel and how do i parse out my feelings about what it means to make a movie like this when you become involved well, and pres- I just I don't know it presents it in the in a weird and this is sort of what I meant earlier when I said that it really draws from European cinema history it both draws attention to the form which is something like very nouvelle vague-ish very French new wavy at the same yeah. time it's going for a hyper realist like you were saying here is the truth yeah. the truth is fake but here is this fake truth presented without any bells and whistles which really reminds me a lot of the Italian neorealist movement that came out of the yeah. second world war which is like we just want to yeah. shoot real people we want to shoot real situations and what people look like and feel like and talk like right now after the war instead of this sort of like fake art cinema that traditionally European yes. cinema had been but at the same time because of the found footage format of the the pretense itself it's drawing attention to the camera within the film you constantly yes. are reminded that you're looking at a film that is being shot right there and that is has been edited and presented to you in some sort of you know formal package what i also find really interesting is that how the form makes us look at violence so much differently because yeah. again this film came out the same year that Reservoir Dogs was being released I think it had yeah. premiered at festivals the year before and was being released widely in 92 Bad Lieutenant yeah. the Apple Ferrara film was also being released uh, yeah. um, but this is the one that got a lot of shit for its vi- depiction of violence <laughs> It famously, apparently, Tarantino got into a fist fight with some security guards at Cannes because he couldn't get into the second screening of the film. <laughs> the director of the Tokyo Film Festival uh, was fired for booking the film and then it was banned afterwards. Uh, the US release just cut out. With, this is why I find really funny. In the year that Tarantino was making his big, hyper violent debut film, the US release cut all the all the killing, the gunplay, the strangulations, uh, the so rape. Just cut the whole movie. <laughs> yeah, so it became like this this nonsensical mishmash. What I found really funny is that it was banned in the UK after being released in cinemas for a month. This is all written up in an article from the time in The Independent, uh, which you should go check out because it's quite funny. But my favorite part is that the BBFC, which is the British Board of Film Certification, uh, which is like the rating system in the UK, they passed an uncut for video distribution for home entertainment because, and I quote, they said, it's in black and white and foreign, and they felt that nobody would see it anyway. So thus removing the need to censor it. Which is fucking hilarious. It's like, oh, it's like a weird God. Right, Belgian everyone, art movie. This. Nobody gives a you shit. Just put, you just put that shit in black and white and no one will, no one will care. <laughs> Which I actually think is like... Wait, that's so funny. I know, oh, right? I actually think it's like a very <laughs> smart adult media literate way to look at a film it's like oh you're making a super dark mockumentary about a serial killer 
you are some like Belgian art film students who've made this this piece of work. It's got some credibility and some you know uh, attention at Cannes, one of the biggest film festivals in the world. I get that children are probably not going to seek out a Belgian art horror film. So I think we're cool. The people who will find this movie probably know what it's about. It's got a man That's shooting very, yeah. shooting someone in the head on the cover. That's a very I, honestly that is a really good point. Like no kids going to try to watch this. This is too into like this might be a little bit too highbrow for like the kids who want to watch titties and like people blowing up and like the evil dead. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, I want to move on to Behind the Mask because to okay. quote <laughs> To quote Leslie Vernon, I wouldn't suggest reading Grey's Anatomy to kids, and I wouldn't suggest re- watching Man Bites Dog to kids either. I love this movie. <laughs> Paradise Lost, found it. <laughs> so, first of all, this is a, a, a similar conceit, but very different tone. Oh, Tell so me. So different. About the first time you discovered Behind the Mask, The Legend of Leslie Vernon. So I actually watched this for a podcast because I, I and I was so excited to watch it because I was like, I want, I, I knew more of it as like a meta horror commentary than as mm-hmm. like a pseudo documentary or as found footage. And I wasn't, at, and before this, I hadn't been as like slasher educated. So I had watched this when I was a little bit more like knowledgeable about slashers and had seen more slashers. And I love, I love movies. Like it's basically feels like I love Christopher Guest movies with like Best in Show and mm-hmm. The Mighty Wind. And this is basically like a, a, more of a Christopher Guest serial killer movie, yes. which I very much appreciate. I love that. It's it works for me. Perfect comparison. Yeah, Christopher. If it's like if Christopher Guest made a serial killer movie about a guy who just wants to be the next big thing, and like, <laughs> it's so good. It's so and like, well, Man Bites Dog is like bleak, dark, dry, funny. Like Behind the Mask is actually, I think, quite hysterical. It's so and funny. very funny, and like, it's trying to be like a try and true horror comedy. But I like that. I'm not usually a big horror comedy person, but I really respect what this movie is doing and all the different Mm. layers to it that like it works for me i mean just from the title itself i find leslie vernon to be a hilarious name for a serial killer no one named leslie will ever commit a murder it's just well (laughs) i'm not prognosticating but it's such a good name (laughs) It's so ridiculous. I love it so much. Because, like, it just rolls off the tongue, though. I mean, come Mm -hmm. on, like, Jason Voorhees, Freddy Krueger, Leslie Burr. And just, like, (laughs) the amount of syllable. Like, it just has a good mouthfeel. And it sounds so silly out at, like, in, like, in a vacuum you're like Leslie Vernon like what kind of weird, like, old woman name is that? And then it's this guy. It's just, like, a guy. It's just a guy. It's just a guy (laughs) with a mentor, with a dream, and his dream is to be the next Freddy or the next Michael Myers. And this is what I want to talk about because I find the way that this film interacts with horror film history to be super clever. How does it do it? Well, I mean, everything about this movie is like it it's all about slashers and like the movies that came before it. This isn't a movie trying to like make up other like make up fictional in world serial killers or in world fictional serial killers. Like this one is very much like, oh no, like we we exist in this in the world that you know. And mm-hmm. Leslie is trying to be a part of this. I mean, like, you know, we even have like his mentor is supposed to be what Billy from Black Christmas. Yes. Um, his mentor Eugene. Yeah. Yes. And like, you know, we have we also have oh my god, my name, his name. Oh my god. Robert Englund playing like the Dr. Loomis character. Mm-hmm. And like there's just so many like, you know, we have Freddy Krueger himself playing the Dr. Loomis character from Halloween and it's just these interactions with horror is so fun and this is one of those movies where like if you don't know these things it might not be as fun for you like i it's not often that i'll say that but i think this is a movie that you need to have some slasher slash serial killer horror knowledge to like really understand like the different levels that 
we're working on and like all the jokes that are happening here yeah it's really i mean the robert england cameo uh zelda rubenstein from polka poltergeist so shows up as well love her but like they're doing interviews as the as if it's real in this universe which is yeah. so interesting like they have the real people who played these characters in these movies giving interviews but like as if they're actual real it's just so interesting the world that they craft here and like what is fictional and what is not in the world of leslie Burman. well it basically takes takes the stance that freddy michael uh, jason all were real life serial killers that existed that it's sort of a that it's a career that all those tropes that happen in slasher movies about the final girl and you know the people stumbling down on on Ooh, firm ground yeah the virgin all of this stuff actually happens constantly like it's just normal that's what people do and even the his mentor Eugene, aka Billy from Black Christmas, the fact that he's you know has a whole speech about how he was started off or was a pioneer in the business of fear, but he wasn't oh given his God. dues because he was so ahead of his time, is like these are wonderful tongue in cheek references to slasher film history, and it just doesn't make a big deal out of it. Like if you know, you know, nah. but then it can also exist as a funny mockumentary in its own right like in a way that if you're not yeah. very familiar with like um heavy metal or glam rock spinal tap <laughs> might just exist on a different plane for you and if you're familiar with all of those uh all of those conventions and those styles and those bands then it's gonna operate on a whole different level on the whole different level of uh of cleverness but I do find it really curious as well that this film sort of arrives in a moment in 2006 where we're in the middle of a particular nasty moment of horror between sort of por uh, between torture porn and extremely hyper violent horror films after you know the the directly the post saw era. What do you think it's yeah. trying to say about this mid aughts era of horror? That's so interesting because I feel like this movie for me flew under the radar at this moment when it first came out to me because I feel like there was so much torture porn and this mm. is so engaging with things on such like a metal level. Mm -hmm. Also 2006, I was watching torture porn and wasn't as like clued in to like the indie horror releases, unfortunately, as a child. <laughs> but I do think that it has a really interesting, it's a really interesting moment to come out in terms of like dissecting horror history up until this point and also like the relationship with violence and our own relate and like again like in man bites dog a very similar like relationship with violence but here we have a much more i think interesting dialogue with the filmmakers because we have like an on-screen host here who's kind of like always on screen kind of guiding us through and is our kind of our virgil if you will with leslie vernon and i think and that character is a woman and in man bites dog they're all men perpetuating this violence. So it's really interesting to have a female character who, you know, women are so often the ones that are getting murdered by these slasher villains and having a woman here kind of side by side with him is such an mm -hmm. interesting choice too. I think especially in this moment when we're so used to seeing the female body absolutely wrecked mm -hmm. by slasher characters and by in torture porn, like in, in hostile in Saw, I mean, I know it's ever it's kind of a everyone gets what they get kind of thing, but it's an interesting kind of commentary there. But I think it is just a really a a movie that is trying to kind of engage with the horror history in a very direct way, rather than I think with torture porn, which I think is engaging with horror history in a very violent way, mm -hmm. which I think is really interesting. But this movie, I think, comes in and is trying to have a broader conversation about like where we are at in the state of horror and what does it mean to still watch horror in a world where we're post 9-11 and there's so many terrible things happening why why like why continue to consume this what is the point and what happens when we turn to violence like what is that kind of what happens there and also interestingly it's not a, and contrary to man bites dog it's not a very violent film it's no there's kills but they're not really the point of the film mm -mm. we don't spend too much time on them i think we're, like when i was rewatching it i barely remember any sort of hyper violent 
kill scenes. Yeah. It's really just about, it's about him as a person more yes. than it is about him as a killer, which I think is interesting. I think they're, and like, you know, on one hand you could say, oh, why do we need to humanize a serial killer, especially mm-hmm. in 2006 or every, we already are scared of everything and everyone. But I also think it's interesting to have that conversation about an everyday person being able to commit, like, or even consider violence. Like, yes, it's wrapped or up in aspire this kind of to silly- violence. Yes, like it's all wrapped up in this kind of silly metal horror package. Yeah, mm-hmm. but like, I don't know. I think there are so often people are like, if you watch a horror movie, you're going to be violent. Like my family doesn't fully think that, but they're like, you're so yeah. nice. How could you watch a horror movie? Yes. This, this assumption that consuming horror, like playing video games, all that shit is going to make you inherently a bad person. Mm-hmm. And I think this kind of this movie is confronting maybe those Maybe not directly, but in a way kind of engaging with this idea of like, well, if a person like what what does it take for a person to aspire to violence? Why do they aspire to violence? Is it is it because of horror movies or is it something deeper than that? Well, and also <laughs> and it, because I I tend to over intellectualize things anyway, both on this show and oh, in my news. life. But <laughs> I do think that it also taps into this like hilarious irreverence that horror fans and horror film culture has that I love. Like the amount yes. of videos of Michael Myers and Ghostface dancing to Sabrina Carpenter's espresso that I've saved <laughs> on my phone. It's the I think that is the exact same mood as Leslie Vernon. Because it is That's funny. Such a good point. It's so fucking funny. And horror film culture is very, very fucking funny. And I it's love it funny. when people make memes and jokes and lovely merch that is poking fun at these super violent films. Like we wa- I deeply like respect and love horror, obviously. But I think also part of it is being able to laugh at the extremity of these situations. And even, you know, when you instantly went Paradise Lost found it, the amount of zingers in this film had me cackling. You know, it's like, oh you have well, no idea how much cardio I have to do to chase these people around. The cardio. <laughs> like it's all about the cardio. It's yeah. all about the cardio. And it's just like <laughs> And it's so funny because we always joke like horror fans about how they're always walking really slow and yeah, like, we yeah. joke about that. And like, and I think you know, back to your question about like how this interacts in 2006. I also just think this is like a bomb of a movie mm-hmm. to like the hyper violent time. I think this is a movie that's like, Hey, what if we look back at horror as a whole and can kind of laugh and love this community and love the history that we've created and like what happens if someone looks up to the like obviously I love to over intellectualize too, but I also think it is just like kind of a a, a foil to what we were expecting back yes. then. And this is such a love letter to classic slasher, like eighties horror cinema that I think we weren't having back in the in like the, that time. It was just very new stuff that was mm. awesome. But this feels like the foil to that. Like, what about something that's vi- like obviously kind of gr- scary but is making us fall back in love with horror and why we love horror so much but also uh, interestingly isn't trying to be said in the 80s it does feel very yeah. mid odds it does and it's so it's i love that though it's not mm-hmm. trying to tap into that like necess- it's like you know right now we are so there's so many movies that are like nostalgia yeah, this isn't yeah, necessarily yeah. nostalgia, which is interesting. It's yeah. like, it's a love letter, but it's not trying to be one of those movies. It's mm-hmm. more trying to be like, it is a love letter and like, but in its own way. And I think that's also really smart in terms of not trying to make it an 80s slasher, but like, hey, what if this guy grew up watching them and like, can't do anything else and aspires to be this? Like, because he loves them so much. It's so silly and kind of fucked up, but I love it. <laughs> what if being a slasher killer is a career choice? What happens then? How do you get that? How do you just, achieve that dream? T- just the way they had people talking about, like, the le- like these people, like, as if they had careers. Like you said, like, as if they were, like, mm-hmm. sport, like, star, like, sports stars. I yeah. just love that. And how we have the actual actors talking about this. It's just so smart and fun. And, like, it's a fun watch, but also a very smart watch. Mm. Like... There's just a lot of, like I said before, like layers of history interacting here while also crafting something, I think, different 
And what do you think about Nathan Basil's performance? So Nathan Basil, I'm not entirely sure how to say his name. I am obsessed. <laughs> I mean, I think it's like the first part, he's pretty quiet. Like he, we, we get this vibe that he is like the Jason Voorhees type at first. But then like when we really get him talking and really get him joking, like he's so good. Like, he's just, I want more of him. I think he's got great comedic timing. Like we said, like a lot of the comedy sits on his shoulders, but also like a lot of emotional stuff lies on his shoulders too. Like you kind of like, like Leslie while in like man bites dog. I was like, Ben is fucking terrible. And this, I'm like, I kind of like Leslie. Like, even though he's a serial killer, like he kind of seems like a, a, a cool dude. <laughs> Maybe I'm, like, sick in the head. But there's, like, something about him that you like. You're not as scared of him as you're scared of Ben, to me, as I was Mm. watching. (laughs) Yeah, he's not really scary. I mean, he's very playful. uh, And because we're kind of in this heightened world, you also don't quite believe him to be real. You know what I mean? He goes like a Muppet. He's like a Muppet serial killer. Exactly. And also, you know... The fact that he he only made like a couple more films during that time. So the again the fact that he's a relative unknown. I've only ever seen this actor play Leslie Vernon in my head. He's always going to be Leslie Vernon, and there's long be- uh, been conversations about possibly a sequel, and that's kind of never materialized. And I yeah. think part of the part of the reason why he feels so effortlessly authentic is because it doesn't feel like acting it feels like improv it's almost like you're watching yes! not so much a documentary but like an extended snl sketch where yes! he just doesn't break character <laughs> that's exactly it it feels like a sketch like this guy is just like playing a character of his life and he's just like i'm having the best time just like improvising all these weird ass lines and explaining mm-hmm. to you my plans and just like telling you my backstory it's just like it's just like you're watching improv of a guy who's just trying to be famous and you're just watching him desperately trying to like cling at that and you could easily make this movie about like a struggling improv comedian or like a comedian and i feel like you just had to swap out some stuff and like it would be the same story which i love though it feels like not universal but there is like that kind of hinting at universal like you just want to be famous and like just want people to recognize you Mm -hmm. Even and- though you're doing it through murder. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, there's murder, there's publishing a selfie book. I don't know which one's worse. Time will tell. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <It's> incredible. <laughs> and how, oh. one of the things I find really interesting about this film, that it's both, it sort of like changes course halfway through the film it switches from being a mockumentary to a straightforward slasher film does that switch work for you i think so i think they do a lot of the work to set it up and i feel like they could have just capped it a regular you know mockumentary style but i love that they switch it because i think again the found footage format more broadly and I love with the pseudo documentary format when people can really experiment with form and not just keep it to the expected, like someone's got a camera and we're following around. Mm -hmm. Cause obviously I love that in a lot of, in a lot for a lot of reasons, but I love here again, just fucking with form and fucking with your expectations about what you're going to see and what kind of story you're being told because you know, we're thrown into this movie that's a meta commentary on slashers and like, Oh, well this is so different from a slasher. But then it's like, psych, you're getting your own kind of slasher movie at the end. And you get to see all of the tropes come into play at once. And it's like, to me, I don't think it could end any other way. Personally. I think it fits so well with what this movie is doing and saying that like, it has to end that way. Mm. And I love that. I mean, I love the way that, you know, the story is set up so that the, filmmakers themselves are part of the slasher storyline you know they're actually yeah. the victims that he's been setting up the entire time <laughs> oh, she's the final girl i yeah. love it so much i do love it i i have to say and maybe this is more on the rewatch that i did this week i did lose interest 
noticeably okay. more after the Switch. Yeah. And I think that's just more because I was so into the mockumentary format and so yeah. into Leslie being kind of peacocking around that once yeah. we shifted into, oh, we're a slasher film now. And because I've, I've just never been a slasher hardcore girly yeah you know i i love the inventive ones the ogs but i have very limited patience for the formula for all the tropes yes and and once we started hitting all those beats i'm like i don't need the beats i know i know the song i'm 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 okay thank you but it i narratively genius but I did feel my interest really dip once we just got into yeah. serious killing. That's so interesting, too, because I am not a big slasher girly either. It took mm. me so long, like, in the past, like, less than a decade to, like, actually, like, engage with slasher movies, like, mm-hmm. more, like, thoughtfully, just because... I don't know. They're formulaic. I, I don't give them... I didn't give them a lot of credit for a long time. Um... So it is surprising to me that I love the way this ends, but mm-hmm. hey, I don't know. It works. It works. I, for I think me. maybe it's because narratively it is a, it is a twist on the slasher because you've been expecting this one thing for half the movie, and then suddenly it pulls the rug from under you. I think for me it was just like if if it had the change formally to just oh we've forgotten the found footage pretense. Um, I personally yeah. found a bit jarring. But I can see exactly yeah. how it's set up brilliantly. It works. It's well, the only way it could have like, ended. I love, yeah, and I love that in 2006, too, because, again, like, 2006 is, like, right on the cusp of, like, the, like, you know, Cloverfield was 2000 and, oh, God, I get them mixed up all the time. I'm a terrible scholar. Paranormal Activity and Cloverfield were 2008 and 2007. So, like, we're right. That's, like, the cusp of when found footage is, like, how to have a renaissance. Because we obviously had Blair Witch Project in 1999. And then for almost a decade, it was, like, silence. Like, there is no way we could make another found footage movie like this. Like, it's so singular in what it is. And there's this, like, long period of time. There's obviously some. Like, Collingswood Story from 2001 is the first screen life movie, arguably, that comes out. The Black Door, directed by a woman, is really good, but impossible to find. In Memoriam is another directed by a woman found footage movie from 2005 that's all shot on security cameras. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. But again, these are all like movies I know about because I'm a freak and like deep dive, but they're not really well known. So like found footage was relatively unknown until this time period. So the fact that Leslie Vernon comes out in 2006 is also so cool. It's on the cusp of this like format and pseudo documentary is not really a big thing yet either. Like we haven't got like Mo- like Mongo's coming very soon, but like this is such an important movie in terms of like the format mm-hmm. of what found footage can be because we obviously have the paranormal activities and clover fields of it all. But then Leslie Vernon kind of marks this important like well another form of found footage that you don't think about that I think flew under the radar because it's not as quote unquote scary as the other two like that got such like acclaim but mm-hmm. it is so important for what the format has become it's like a huge touching a touching point for me i think in terms of the evolution of the pseudo documentary specifically and then to ra- start wrapping both of these together where do you see yeah. the influence of both film both of man bites dog and leslie vernon on the pseudo documentary of the found footage genre. Yeah. Well, I mean, Man Bites Dog has obviously had a massive influence on so many. Like, I, I know it influenced Blair Witch Project. And mm-hmm. Leslie Vernon obviously was influenced by Man Bites Dog. But then, like, you know, we have, like, Mungo come out in 2008? I believe so. I'm so bad with dates. I just feel like all of this, like, that time period, I just feel like it all runs together in my brain. But, well, it was the 2000s, so that's when yes. I think both of us grew up, so they all yes, mashed together. Yes. And <laughs> Paranormal Activity was 2007, and I think yes, Cloverfield okay. was 2008. Yes, okay. I get those two mixed up, which I shouldn't, but I do, because they're just so close. But anyway, I think... You know, we have Lake Mungo in 2008, which is its own thing. I think, like, you can obviously, like, compare form, but I think it's just, like, that's its own thing. But I do think that, you know, Leslie Vernon kind of 
I don't know if gave permission, but I think it showed that you can make a movie like this and have it be kind of silly and referential and interesting and play with form. And I think it had, I think that influenced like meta horror in general, not just the like found footage, but I also think like pseudo documentary is like, you would think about like also the Poughkeepsie tapes. I think the Poughkeepsie mm-hmm. tapes is very much influenced by man bites dog, even though it's just him do like, there's a really interesting through line with that and the serial killer and that, and what it looks like to capture a serial killer on camera through his eyes. And so I think these, both of these movies kind of, I'm not sure gave permissions the right word, but I'm going to use it like kind of gave permission to filmmakers to like really play with the form and not be afraid of what that form can look like. And I love that because you think about like Hell House LLC is a found footage movie, but there is like a pseudo documentary like wraparound around it. And I think there is these movies kind of prove that really interesting inter- like meta interaction with filmmakers through interviews and everything to make it really feel like a documentary and what it means to play with truth in such a really fascinating way. Um, and I think these were two like big precursors before like like Mungo and the Poughkeepsie tapes came out. And I think really show like what it means to really fuck with truth even more than just a found footage movie. Because with these two films, Behind the Mask more so than Man by Dog, because there's a little bit more like production value in Behind the Mask in terms of like setting up interviews. Mm -hmm. But again, we kind of touched on this is like the warping of truth. Is this real? Is this not? Obviously, Behind the Mask is more obvious. But I think these pseudo documentaries really give people and by people I mean filmmakers, a way to play with what it means to create reality mm-hmm. and fake, like what it means to fake reality and how easy that can be, but also how difficult that can be. Mm-hmm. And I love that. I love these kinds of films that really manipulate how we perceive what is real and what is not, what is true and what is not, which is especially, I'm like going to plug myself. I'm so sorry. I wrote a chapter about this topic in yeah. um, Filtered Reality, the House of Leaves publishing book about found footage and wrote about like Mungo and the Poughkeepsie tapes and how important these movies are, especially now when like we're all so inundated with like fake news and what it means to create fake news and scare quotes and like the responsibility of a filmmaker, but also like our responsibility as people to be able to like kind of media literacy and being able to tell what's real and what's not. And it's a really interesting form, especially now when there's so much fake information and how we parse through what, is actually a fact and what is being constructed. Oh my god, I was about to say the same thing. And I'm, uh, that sounds like <laughs> such a fascinating book and chapter that you contributed. But it's exactly that. It's it's how do we filter when our governments are constantly lying, when news channels are lying, when even the concept of fake news has become shorthand for news in some yep. senses. And also, additionally, with social media, we are constantly creating bubbles for ourselves that create a sense of reality for us that is just one tiny part of the world, That, but yep. that we feel comfortable in. That's the bubble that we choose to exist in. And sometimes it's very difficult for people to look beyond their immediate bubble. So this form and the way that it interacts with horror and with truth is I find so much more interesting now and so much more prescient and and kind of scary on a big existential level now considering where we are on the media and and in the political landscape. But I did want to ask specifically about the killers, about Ben and Leslie, because we're also going through... And this is part of the reason why I wanted to do this series now. We're going through almost this fatigue with serial killer narratives, particularly in true crime, particularly in podcasts. But when I say fatigue, it doesn't mean that it's gone, it's grown any less small of a cottage industry built around revisiting, retelling, rediscovering archive and serial killer stories and it's constantly focused on the killers and there's true crime conventions that might explore in kind of a standalone episode but both ben and leslie in these films are presented as hyper violent goofs they're very much not the image of the serial killer that exists in um, true crime narratives and in a lot of the horror movies that um that i've covered on a series so far 
does a goofy serial killer have the same effect on you? That's a... You sent me this, and I was thinking about it. Because at first, I want to say no. Uh-huh. But... I think... Because with Ben, he's a hyper-violent goof, but, like, it's not endearing. And I think you can tell that the goofiness is a mask and obviously and in Leslie Vernon, you can as well, but there is more of kind of like, like I mentioned, a more of an empathy slash kind of. Hmm. There's a better mask, a, pre- a better mask. And because so often, like people want to romanticize serial killers. Mm-hmm. You think of you. I've never watched it. Yeah. So I'm, if I'm off base, I apologize everybody, but like you and romanticizing that and romanticizing any kind of like minorly attractive character who is a bad person and who is doing like excessively bad things over and over again and is meant to be like a killer. I think, I think having a goofy killer has the same effect if they are just as cruel as they are funny, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. With Leslie, it's effective, but I think it's only, it's it's interesting because I think it's effective because I know what it's trying to do, but like, it's not as creepy and scary as a man by its dog, if that Yes. If I'm making my point here, you know what I mean? Like, there's a point to which it feels like you're just trying to make me identify with the killer and to kind of empathize mm. or, like, see them as something that I really don't want to. And sometimes, like, I'm impressed if a movie can make me feel that way. But I think trying to have an empathetic killer is something you have to be really careful with. Mm-hmm. In these kinds of movies, I think it's not, I don't think you shouldn't do it, but I also think there's a responsibility to like not trying to glamorize or the violence. Because again, I think in Man Bites Dog, there isn't necessarily a glamorizing of the violence. I think it's like, uh, this is fucked. I don't, I don't see like kind of a glamorizing or anything like that, where I think a lot of true crime stuff nowadays might even unintentionally glamorize some of the violence. Mm. I'm getting off base here with like the question. I'm sorry. No, it's it's just like a hard, it's, it's like a hard question because like I think goofy serial killers are weird like as a concept. I don't love them because I think you're trying to get me to like a character that yeah. I don't really want to like. But at the same time Well, I think it's a it's a really hard yeah. question and I'm <laughs> yeah. I'm also ambivalent on it. Uh because as I was rewatching these films, like I find Ben like really repugnant both as a dude and as a killer. And I think part of both of these films, kind of with um, Leslie Vernon, is a bit more, like you mentioned, a love letter to horror film history and to slasher films. At the same time, the cavalier way that both these characters talk about murder, and in the case of Ben, the way that they show murder and bodies and disposing of bodies, is... I think the whole point of these films is to show how desensitized we can be when it's a run-of-the-mill thing. And I think the point I was making earlier of the films being very uninterested, Leslie Vernon plays around with this, but you never quite know what's the truth, whether he is just a, a mentally unstable man who's not taking his meds or whether he's actually like a, a born professional serial killer. But they're both taking to an extreme this idea of oh you want to know you want to look well then look look during the entire process not just at the end when you can have some nice talking heads that pretend to care about the victims when actually all you really want to see is the violence and I think making it goofy actually makes me more uncomfortable with the violence yeah that's a good point like if you watch long pigs you'll get that because the guy's kind of silly but then Mm -hmm. he's like butchering a person and it's just like i don't like that you're laughing through this like this is making me feel sick and you're just kind of like giggling and there is an uncanny weirdness like you said to that of like 
wait, the emotional disconnect happening right now is yeah. very strange. But also the emotional disconnect is something that I think is inherent to the serial killer figure. Like if you're able to yeah. murder people, if you're fantasizing of that about that, if that gets you off, you are completely severed from humanity you don't see other people as humans it's just you in the universe alone and everyone is just a thing and i think that is a very hard thing for us to wrap our minds around and if you filter it through this goofy comedic approach weirdly it goes hard it goes in harder if that makes sense. Yeah. Because suddenly you're like, wait, I'm also laughing at this because these lines are funny and this is hilarious. But wait. And I think Man Bites Dog is a bit more um, intense about it because the film is more intense. The film is more violent. Yeah. Uh, and it's concerned with, the, it, it tries to replicate real life murder as opposed to, you know, talking about fictional killers that we may or may not recognize. But I think at the, at the heart of both these films, there's this really intensely complicated conceit of, do you want to see everything that this thing that you're so interested in involves? Do you want to see how the sausage is made, basically? And what if while the sausage is being made, we're also going to make fun of the sausage? Yep. <laughs> I'm just going to make fun of the sausage. I, sausage is an inherently funny word, so. It really is, too. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Mary Beth, is there anything that we haven't covered about either of these films that you wanted to bring up before we wrap up? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think we've covered everything. We ended in a really hard question. And I thank you Love for it. your time and for your insight. And where can people find more of your work online? So you can follow me on Twitter at MB McAndrews. That's where you can see all of the things that I do and all of that. But um, that's the best place and at Dread Central for all things that we're putting out over there. But if you want to see all of my work, MB McAndrews on Twitter is the best way to go. Get all the updates. And when is your book coming out? Great question. Probably early next year. Okay, amazing. I'll keep an eye out. Thank you so much. <laughs>